I'm John Diarmo with the Cookie of Ice Group, and today we have uh, a little bit of announcements before we get into our video. Uh, Eddie and I have been talking it over, and we've decided that the next kind of uh, video series we want to shoot uh, in conjunction with the remaining uh, Nito Seho and then Kodachi Seho katas for Hyoho uh, are a series on uh, the German use of the Rondel dagger. The rondelle is sort of the, it is the wakazashi in Tonto of the sort of German knights um, uh, during the period that we have fighting manuals from. And it is, uh, it is both easy to approach for beginners and really informative. Um, if you do any kind of uh, wrestling with the blade type sword work. Uh, so any of the German fencing uh, or Hyoho or any sort of styles that are sort of similar in tactics to that, learning how to fight and wrestle with a dagger, uh, it really makes you understand how to shape your body, why you shape it that way, um, and how you can begin to, to relate uh, to your opponent, not in terms of distance, but in terms of, of orientation. Um, this will be a little bit more clear when we do the videos. Uh, but since neither Eddie nor myself is uh, anything like an expert in the German Rondell fighting, we're not. We're thinking of doing a format where we don't talk a lot, where we just uh, show the the play that we're doing maybe the play series, like this is the start, here's the counter, here's the counter for the counter, sort of so forth and, and so on. Um, maybe including the uh, specific section of the text that we're working from. Um, we, we don't really know yet, but we figured we'd ask you guys, what would you like to see? Um, is, do you have a format that you uh, are looking for? that you don't think is out there, um, just give us your opinions. Doesn't mean we'll take them, of course, but uh, we, we'd like them anyway. As for uh, today's video, we are going to kind of dovetail this into talking about knives. Uh, knives that we carry in our day-to-day -day and uh, sort of why we carry them or the, the thought process behind them. Um, so, I've been asked, uh, get quite a lot of emails actually <laughs> over the YouTube channel, more than I, more than I thought we would, um, and most of it is, is pretty straightforward stuff, you know, who's your teacher, you know, who would win in a fight, Superman or Jackie Chan kind of stuff. Um, but something that I've gotten a lot of, which uh, sort of surprised me, was people wanted to know what kind of, uh, knife I carried, or if I, if I carried a blade because I followed the way of the samurai. First off, uh, if anybody anywhere tells you that they are a samurai, they are lying to you, right? <laughs> a samurai was a social caste that was abolished, right? You, people can say, my family used to be samurai back in the day, but that says nothing about the person. It doesn't really say anything at all. Um, so, uh, Beware of people trying to sort of like puff themselves up a little bit with this kind of nonsense. Um, right? It's, it's just a word. <laughs> um, anyway, so, uh, yes, yes, I carry a knife. Um, uh, especially living where I do out in the sort of rural Oregon, a knife is just a day to day necessity. Um, uh, Though, it is not my primary defensive tool. I carry a pistol, uh, mostly, but uh, we're going to focus on the knife. So, um, what knife do I use? This is uh, the one I've had for several years, and it is probably the model I will continue to buy for as long as they make it, unless I find something better. It is the Columbia River Knife and Tools, nice Oregon company, uh, Hisatsu. Now, 
Uh, this design was made in collaboration with James Williams from Nami Ryu, uh, a sort of modern made uh, American uh, Japanese flavored uh, sword art. And uh, really, these are great knives. <laughs> there's there's so much good to say about them and uh, very little bad. So I will go ahead and get the bad out of the way first um, and sort of work from there. As you can see, this uh, thing I've had this one for seven years and I had another before this uh, for a period of time. Uh, as they come uh, from the factory, at least the, the models and iterations I've gotten, they are, they are, uh, they have a quite pronounced tip. And this is modeled after the Osaraku style of dagger, um, which is a broadly tipped, sort of small cutting body. Um, but they're, they, from the factory, they lack what we call fukura. Uh, fukura is the degree of roundness in the tip that you see in actual uh, working tanto, tanto from the time period, uh, or from Japanese history in general. And because of that sort of flatness and lack of belly, it really uh, makes the tip quite fragile, and they have a tendency to uh, break. Uh, I've uh, snapped the tip off of this one and the other one. Uh, though. Uh, I'm a little bit of a... I, I put it through heavier use than most people. Uh, for about five years, I was a... I taught uh, primitive skills and wilderness survival here locally. And this basically was my, my go-to everything tool uh, when it came to cutting. Uh, I prepped firewood with it, I built shelters with it. Um, have batoned with it. They're they're really um, very robust for a folder, and uh, I really can't praise them highly enough. Uh, once that tip breaks, though, or through the course of sharpening, which you can see this one has had a lot of sharpenings, the black oxide coat is all the way gone. Um, you can you can begin to give it more fukura, and this will strengthen the tip structurally, which is good. Um, that being said, I have done unkind things to this knife and had it not break. Uh, so I am overall very satisfied with its, with its, uh, construction, with the construction of the blade, sort of, metallurgically. Uh, that being said, it does not hold an edge for very long, necessarily, um, depending on what you're cutting, of course. Um, I would say that it's got sort of medium edge holding ability. And it has no sort of flexion strength if you're trying to use it in a prying motion. Uh, I don't know if you can see right there that I have a little bit of tip damage because uh, I was digging something up the other day. I've got to fix it on the grinder. Um, so yeah, edge is a little pointy. Not real great, but uh, the only other complaint I have is that it's uh, the outer scales, they start off with a sort of pebbly, uh, almost toad skin texture, uh, which was okay, but uh, you know, after a year or two in your pocket, it just wears completely smooth. So they're, they're quite uh, slick. I wish there was something a little bit more aggressive and almost uncomfortable uh, to really sort of Velcro it on. Because uh, again, for me, I'm in Oregon, it's wet most of the year, and uh, when you're out in the woods, it can be a little bit irritating to be slipping on your knife. The other side of that, though, is this sort of wasted design, where we're thinner in the center than on either side. Uh, this is, again, it harkens back to the Tonto uh, Ska design elements and is very comfortable. Um, even as it starts to get 
slicker and looser. Uh, I've only uh, lost it once or twice out of my hand. Um, so they're, they're really nice. In terms of the actual physical locking mechanism, it employs the auto locks system. So it's a standard uh, liner lock. In other words, it's just got that bar that keeps the blade from depressing. Once that bar slaps out when the blade's open, this auto locks lever is freed and a small uh, bar drops and it keeps that liner lock from closing. Um, so where a lot of folders, the action tends to be the weakest part of them and uh, with just a little bit of force or torque, you can really just snap the whole structure and have it close on your hands or have it break apart. Uh, the auto locks is, is very, uh, very robust. Now, this comes from the factory. Again, in Oregon, uh, spring-assisted and automatic knives are legal to own. Um, uh, I ended up having, I was going to a seminar in uh, California where they're not, so I took the spring-assisted bar out and honestly, I just, uh, I never put it back in. I don't, I don't really see the need for it. It's, it's fun, um, but not at all necessary. Yeah, I mean, that's, they're great knives. And I think that you can pick them up for a little under 50 bucks now. Uh, it used to be more expensive, and they were worth it then, so they're really a, really a good deal now. Um, so, there, this knife, while certainly uh, small enough to be handy for the kind of day-to-day -day tasks that a person uses a knife for, is uh, purpose-built for working on people. So, I figure we could take some time to talk about uh, knife work as it applies to modern times and sort of uh, choice of knife. And I guess the, I've got two kind of points that I really want to hit on and then I'll sort of cut the video off so we won't get too long. Uh, the first is that uh, for most people uh, carrying a fixed bladed knife, in other words a knife that's blade does not fold but stays rigid is um, not feasible, either because it's socially unacceptable or perhaps in the place you live it is actually physically illegal. Um, they can also be uncomfortable, unwieldy in sort of our modern life uh, to have a, a fixed blade of any kind of size on. So uh, these folders are sort of the, the natural solution to that, except as uh, fighting knives <laughs> go, uh, folders are typically very poor. Uh, not because they can't cut, they certainly can. Um, not that because uh, the folding neck mechanism by its very nature makes them weak and unsuitable. So there are lots of really ingenious methods that people have come up with to get a really solid and safe lockup, um, like the auto lock system. Uh, it's more a matter of being able to actually deploy the tool with any kind of speed in a situation that you could legally defend. And that's an important uh, consideration. And the second sort of half of this topic is how using a knife to protect yourself um, can be difficult in terms of uh, legalities. Uh, but let's stay focused on the first part. So, what do I mean? I mean, if the dude comes at me, right, and I get hit or I get struck or whatever, and I understand that, okay, this situation has risen to the level that in my area uh, constitutes the use of a knife for self-defense, then I'm going to have to pull and deploy that weapon, right? And that is, uh, 
it's difficult to do when you're not under stress, right? When you're being hit in the head, it becomes very, very hard. Uh, in our, in the systemic classes we teach, we do a lot of work with this. Uh, we have a lot of folding knife trainers and we encourage people to find or make uh, trainers that simulate their knives as closely as humanly possible so that they can understand whether or not the tool that they're using that they carry with them every day that they have the sort of imagined idea that uh, they will be able to like oh I am being attacked by muggers I pull out my knife and I do my ninja nonsense and yeah I am the winner and hero to all mm, everyone finds out that it doesn't work that way uh, that they can't get their knife out that they fumble their knife, their knife ends up on the floor, they can't get it open, uh, they're, they, they sustain too much physical damage uh, before they manage to deploy the knife successfully. Uh, it, it, it really is, is quite difficult. Um, that being said, it's not impossible, right? But by and large, there are going to be better options for you in that kind of situation when you're getting sort of attacked out of nowhere. And why do we focus on that? Because if you see the attack coming, you should have already done everything you can to dis distance yourself and to protect yourself uh, before you have to resort to physicality. Now, in the event that that is not possible for you, right? You s so the attack uh, the situation matures in front of you, you see it coming, you have time to access your tool. If you can get your knife in your hand, then uh, your deployment rate is, is very successful. Like pretty much everybody after an hour of work can bring their knife into play and immediately uh, sort of resolve the attack with it. But it's important to consider the legal ramifications of that, right? Uh, in, in the state of Oregon, we have three criteria that must be met before a person can use uh, lethal or maiming force on an attacker, right? The attacker has to have demonstrated a willingness to uh, maim or kill you, right? They have to have demonstrated a physical ability to do it and there has to be a disparity of force right in other words uh, if some guy says I'm going to kill you step one right if some guy comes up and hits you step one right now uh, physical ability if the old man at the park in his wheelchair is like I'm starts rolling up on you in his wheelchair and you draw down on him and drop him, you're going to jail, all right? Because he doesn't have the physical capability to inflict the harm that he has the willingness to do, right? Makes sense. Uh, now, if old dude comes at you with this cane, yeah, he's got that physical ability and that willingness. Item number three is where this all sort of gets hairy, disparity of force. Uh, disparity of force means exactly that. It means if I'm unarmed and he draws down on me, then I can raise up to that level and pull out a tool and begin to resolve it. Right? Uh, this disparity of force also works in terms of size and, unfortunately, in the state of Oregon, still gender. Right, so if you are uh, a little, a little old guy, and some, you know, uh, middle-aged dude comes up and tries to hurt you, it's a disparity of force. Right, if you're a, a woman and a, a male of the same age comes up to work you, it's disparity of force. Right, but if violence hasn't happened yet, and you draw your tool. You don't have disparity of force. They draw their tool. 
you you have you have equivalent force here, and it's it becomes a lot more mercurial. Uh, I'll hasten to say that I am not a lawyer, right? Uh, I have lawyer friends, and we've talked about this a lot, uh, but. Uh, don't take this as legal advice. Take it as uh, caution, right? Caution. So, in my opinion, for one, if you get attacked, you are in this tiny, tiny percentile. If you are attacked in a way in which you could, in which a knife would be useful, in which you could actually deploy your knife, and which would be legally suitable, you are at the tiniest percent of a percent of a percent of that edge case that you're already in. So, uh, I really don't think that... I think training is good, right? I, I think training is, is good for who we are as people by and large. And I certainly think that training has lots of practical applications. Uh, even direct applications, like, oh, I'm learning how to work a dude, right? And that's that might be the practical application that I use one day. That being said, I think that it is a mistake to assume that because you carry a pocket knife and that you play around in front of your mirror, that you are going to be able to use that to protect yourself and not go to jail. Right, so do some legal research and uh, think it through, right? And once you've thought it through and you really think you have a grasp on it, get a trainer, a training knife, and work with somebody, right? See if your work can stand up, right? So uh, I think that that's probably enough for right now. Uh, again, if you have opinions on how we should be doing our German knife work videos in terms of format, please leave them down below. And as always, if you want to understand this work, you have to pick up a sword and go train.